Welcome to Hauser & Wirth. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Programs here. We're so happy you're here. I'll hand you this mic um, for this walkthrough of Nicholas Party Swamp with Nicholas Party and Curator of Modern and Contemporary Drawings at the Morgan Library and Museum, Isabel Dervo. Um, I just want to call out that Nicholas is also featured in two other exhibitions in New York if you haven't seen them uptown. One at the Frick Collection, Nicholas Party and Rosalba Carriera, as well as a group show pairing his work with Sophie Tauber Arp at our 69th Street Gallery. More information on both of those shows is at the front desk if you would like to know more. Just a quick note as we walk through today, be careful of your surroundings as we uh, move through since we're a big group. Thank you so much for being here and please join me in welcoming Nicholas Party and Isabel Dervo. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you, Russell, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, before we start talking about this particular work, uh, I wanted to ask you about the whole concept of the exhibition. As usual, you have done something very sort of theatrical with scenography and all. So I was, how do you, do you start with a concept or do you start with the works and then try to find how they can fit? I mean, how does the project come uh, together? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, thanks for being on Saturday morning. Um, Yes, I think it depends obviously, uh, every show is different and this show is like a gallery show so there's you know, mostly new works that are done so I think um, the main kind of uh, maybe input is start with the work and like do, 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 do a new series of, of work that is, because it's, it, most of museum shows you usually kind of use work that exists and you can build maybe a, a narrative or themes from previous years, so previous Themes that you've been working on, as this is like just everything was done in the last like seven months, more or less. So that's that's it's more like you work with the new works, and then in the same time you start to kind of thinking about like how you're going to display the the work with the space. And so pretty quickly we came up with this kind of wall um, that was replicating more or less this, the scale of this big window that you see from outside um, as a kind of introduction for the show and to basically cutting this space in half um, and while you have this mural and the little kind of uh, baby painting and then having this space and the other space with the, the big mural. So in a way like the uh, build out and uh, I guess the uh, architectural intervention in the show is fairly small compared to other things that I did I guess. Right, right. And uh, so it's um, the main murals are those two large landscapes, uh, one of wildfire, the other one of the swamp. And um, if we think of the other exhibitions you have had in New York uh, in the past few years, uh, there is immediately a contrast because the others had landscapes also, but they were more playful, uh, more you know, more joyful. And this uh, is a bit of a darker tone <laughs> to <laughs> the theme of the wildfire or the swamp. And uh, so have you become a bit more uh, pessimistic as you are aging? Or is it, uh, what, what has been the development to arrive at that? Or do you want to address more current issues? Um, I think there's, I mean, the specific subject of the kind of forest fire or red forest, as I call them, came up when I did my show in, in Montreal a few years ago at the, um, at the Montreal Fine Art Museum. And, uh, and basically the whole show was, the theme of the show was about how like nature and our environments were dealt with in kind of Western kind of uh, painting and, and artistry more or less. And we're trying to make different kind of uh, link between our kind of perceptions and feelings about the environment and the world in the 21st century basically doing those bridges with you know how people perceive nature and environment in the previous centuries and times which is always shifting and changing and um, to, to, to arrive at the point of now where basically like our relationship with nature and environment is uh, extremely anxious um, 
and, uh, and, and ideas of uh, extinctions are very different than the, in the previous centuries towards other species, but also towards our species, and we will go back to those ideas. But for that particular show, uh, I want, uh, basically that I did my first kind of uh, forest kind of painting, and it was just maybe a way of being very direct uh, in my own work about the theme in the show. And I didn't know I would do more of this, but I really wanted to have basically like a, like a room with this kind of forest fire, and there was like basically different, like uh, 16th century painting, and I think maybe even an older one of the Sodom and Gomorrah kind of uh, painting, where basically the, you know the, the, the city is in fire, like idea of like walled in flames or actually walled in complete flooding is is an old <laughs> idea of kind of apocalyptic. The flood obviously is like a, one of the most famous one with Noah's Ark saving all the animals. So it's kind of, that was kind of an interesting kind of dialogue to do with all the paintings. But when I did that painting on the forest fire, I really kind of, I was intrigued by the results and it's, it was very different than my previous work. And so I started to do more of those and put them in, in conversation with my work and I guess other works. And for the show, I was like, oh, maybe I'll start with a very kind of <laughs> dramatic kind of start with this big mural. Also, it, it turns out that I was very excited to do a mural with it because the scale is different than, than a canvas. But, and, uh, and we maybe talk a little bit about the, this aspect of the show, my practice, the murals. And uh, so I was like, oh, let's start with this big forest fire and obviously like with in the previous few years, weeks, months, like everybody's have like, you know, the red sky, like the forest in Canada fire, and like in LA, and obviously the, the tragic event in, in Hawaii. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just constantly in the news now. And it's, they became more and more like one of those icon of kind of climate crisis. So if I do it, obviously I'm not gonna deny it. There's, there's an echo with the current kind of, um, discussions about environments and, and what's happening in the world and how we perceive it. Um, so yeah, that was yeah, surely kind of a start that is a bit different because it's true in, in my previous shows I was less kind of in, tempted to just have a very direct, actually sometimes I even don't like that in shows in general. And so it's kind of, but it's very new so I don't really exactly know how I feel about it but um, I wanted to try and like Right, and so significantly you paired it with <laughs> portraits of your daughter. I was actually wondering if it's the birth of your daughter last year which prompted this reflection on what kind of world is she coming into? Yeah, I mean, I think it is also, I can't really deny that because it's, um, and it's, it's true, like, that was not, I didn't really kind of uh, plan from the get-go to put that uh, baby that I made actually uh, for, uh, my wife's birthday, um, <laughs> the little baby is right here. Hi, <laughs> 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 <Nice> Swan. <one. laughs> uh, and, um, but yeah, I thought like, it's like I, I, we would go to see the dinosaurs and I started to do the dinosaurs like really exactly in the same, the same time. And uh, as you know, everybody that's, I mean, we're all kids, but we're maybe not, not everybody had uh, kids, uh, but I think everybody that, that did or reflect on those, it's, it, it gives you a, definitely a different perspective into uh, time and the past and the future. Definitely the future, because I think as soon as you have a, a baby, you do a very kind of clear uh, equation about for how long you're gonna see her. You know, like you know that, you know, let's say I'm gonna die at 90 or 100, you know, that will be good, I guess. <laughs> But that makes her like, oh, I'm going to ignore her until she's 45 or 50, you know. So that's like this kind of idea of time and she will not know me for like, you know, like, a, so that, that's, I think when you, and I was like talking about those, also when you, as soon as you have a baby, like, a, like someone asks you about your will and what, what happened if you die. Like, you know, that's like a, something that's, I never got asked before to say like, you know, it's like, so if you both die in an accident, this one is, the baby, our baby is like left, who's gonna take, you know, like those things you obviously don't think about. So you somehow having a baby, this new life make you think about your own death, like kind of very directly. And so probably like, yeah, kind of make me feel about those kind of, uh, <laughs> which I did think of in the past for sure, but like the baby is definitely bringing a much more direct uh, kind of um, connection to this. And so I think like the, uh, yeah, this super kind of direct, strong <laughs> kind of, connection between the baby that's, you know, yeah, symbolize this fragility, this kind of new birth and this kind of destructive kind of epic kind of uh, mural is obviously making that uh, 
very direct kind of. Uh, but you know, as as we know, like the idea of the baby as the symbol of death is you know as old as as probably baby represented because Jesus is constantly represented as a baby with signs of his you know imminence, basically death. So like all the history of Western painting and babies is connected to birth and basically death, and it's they all very connected. So. Well, we went into uh, deep, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe before we move to look at the other uh, works, uh, I want to talk about your technique, or I want you to talk about it. Uh, as probably everybody knows here, you've been, for the last seven, eight years, most working a lot in pastel, and, uh, and pastel, which has a tradition more of a smaller work, so in a kind of perverse way, you are doing those huge pastels. Um, so, why the pastel for murals? Or maybe we should mention, again, for those who may not know, that for about 10 years you were doing graffiti at the beginning of your career as a teenager. So there was already this uh, habit of working on a wall. Um, so now, how did that translate into working in pastel? And, um, and also, practically, how you do it? Did you have to prepare the surface? And would it go if we blow on it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah, it's an old like. So yeah, I've been doing murals like I guess since I was like yeah, 12, 13 years old, and I always loved the. Uh, I think the perform almost like the perform performative aspect of doing murals, especially with street art, because it's at night and it's very quick, and it's it's much more about doing it than anything else. The visual result is, as we we know sometimes, it's not really the main point. It's just making it that's the main kind of part. And I still have that with doing murals. I love like the this kind of the stress and the pressure and like the the relation with like doing it with my hand and like it's kind of I complain when I do it, but uh, when it's, <laughs> I kind of still like doing it somehow. Uh, but like what happened is like a few years ago, I think I had a show at the the Hammer Museum, and uh, with Ali Subodnik, there was the curator, and with actually Francesca and Kara, like with my gallery in in, uh, in Milan, and uh, I was at that point doing basically charcoal murals a lot. Uh, and actually Francesca uh, said, oh, you should maybe use pastel on the wall. And uh, I said, like, oh, that's not going to work. It's, this is impossible. The texture doesn't work. And somehow it's, that this idea stuck into my head. And, and we tried at the studio to spray the same surface that we spray on the canvas, which is basically like a mix of water and sawdust, which makes the surface like more like sandpaper, basically. We sprayed that on the wall with our like, paint gun. And basically, it worked perfectly well. It was actually very easy. Uh, and as soon as that, that, so that was my first pastel mural in, uh, in, at the Hammer, I did those bowl of peaches. Um, and I loved it from the get go. I think the result was like amazing um, because it's a different point, but obviously because it's like, it's dust. So it's not really paint. So it takes the light in a very different way. As you can see, there's no reflection. It absorbs the light with any, there's no sheen. And it basically, because there's this velvety kind of texture, like it really basically has an effect that it will be completely different if it was paint with oil or acrylic or any other type of paints. Uh, fresco might be like another like great, but that's very complicated to do. <laughs> but um, so yeah, like I, I've been really enjoying those uh, pastel. I think I actually feel that pastel is a fantastic uh, medium for mural because it's also, you work very fast with pastel because you can really do a lot of layers. You don't have to wait the drying time. You work with your hands. Feeling surfaces is so, somehow actually quite fast. Uh, it's again, it's taxing physically because you have to push a lot and like, and it makes a huge amount of dust. So it's a little bit annoying, but the the, the result is like, uh, yeah, kind of pays off for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, great. Maybe we should move to yeah. the next room. We can talk about pastel again. So, uh, should we start maybe with this little dinosaur, and then we we'll talk about the portraits? Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned it already earlier. Uh, first, since we were on technique, this is not a pastel. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, this is oil and copper? Yeah. yeah. So you want to talk how you got to that technique? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, yeah, about the technique. So, like, I think, like, uh, I did a, sh a show a few years ago uh, uh, in Brussels, actually, and uh, at uh, my gallery, Xavier Ofken there. And, and basically, the, a lot of the show was around that uh, Flemish uh, 1600 painter called Jean van Kessel. There's a bunch of van Kessel, but uh, and basically he was doing all those insects um, on on those tiny little copper painting or wood painting, but he was using a lot of copper. 
but I got to his work because of the insects and the trompe l'oeil and like the very kind of weird little mix between science and art that was kind of popular um, or kind of was happening in the, in the 1600s. Uh, and it's later on that I discovered that he was using copper uh, because of the nature of the, um, you know, the, the, the surface is very soft, so it's very good for extreme small detail. And also, the, it's basically one of the golden age of you know, printing, and there's a lot of copper around, so they use the back plates of, uh, of printing to just like paint. Uh, and, and there's also another part of the copper in terms of technique that is interesting is that the copper doesn't move, you know, like canvas and wood moves, moves a lot and does not in the same way than paint, so that's why you have all the cracking. You know, varnish, oil, and the woods moves with the, you know, the moist and the temperature in, in different ways, so you have all those cracking happening. Uh, as copper actually doesn't move much, so basically like uh, there's, very often in copper painting there's no crack. So that's like uh, one of the little advantage of, uh, of copper. There's obviously a different problem because it's metal, so that you can have different. Uh, but if you go to see, uh, if you go to the Met tomorrow and you like go to the, you know, the Flemish wing, uh, you a lot of small work, like the Bruegel family used a tons of copper. Uh, there's a lot of Flemish painter, not only Flemish, it was also used uh, in Italy and in Germany. Uh, but often you can, when it's small, sometimes often in that century, it's actually often copper. Right. And so now we went from this huge mural to this <laughs> tiny painting. So you like those sort of jump in scales? I mean, why not do a big dinosaur, especially a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's more, when I started to do the copper, like I really, I, I chose that medium to do small paintings. And, uh, and when I started to do the dinosaur kind of, uh, you know, route of investigating if, if I could paint those little dinosaurs. Like, uh, I did actually sketches and little studies in pastel, but then I started to, to make them in copper, and I, when, I, when I was painting them, I was like, oh, this is the right scale for those, uh, for those little, for those little, yes, yeah, I call them little dinosaurs now. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like kind of right. So, so that was also a new theme for you, the dinosaurs. Or have you done dinosaurs before? Or? No, that's the. I only did uh, six so far. Uh, so there's two that uh, were in Glasgow. So the first time I showed them was in the show that I did in Glasgow a few months ago. I mean, closed last week um, at the Morning Institute, and I uh, just did those. I did four for here, but we only hanged two, and I'm going to show them in the show that I'm doing in Germany um, in four weeks. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're, and that's definitely, yeah, that came with, uh, in the year of uh, our kind of daughter was, was born. But I was thinking about painting, I guess, monster for a long time, but then, you know, I tried and never came up, but I was thinking about dinosaurs um, every time that I saw actually illustrations, but also the only few times that I saw dinosaur painting by artists, which is basically never. And I, I've been mentioning that a few times that, uh, you know, basically illustrations of dinosaurs and the knowledge of that creature that existed that were fairly large and reptile looking is basically like, you know, almost two, two centuries old. And there was, you know, like mid 19th century, early 19th century, there's il illustrations of, and they look more or less like what you will, they're different obviously, but, and it's, I find it very interesting that uh, from all those 200 years, let's say, uh, more or less, uh, basically no artist ever at any interest. So the children's children's books. Children books. That's and where you illustrations. Have tons of dinosaurs. <laughs> tons of illustrator like love painting and still to this date, but there's almost never an artist, even in the you know, like think about surrealism, think about like the romantic, think about the impressionism, not sure it's the right fit, but could be. <laughs> but you know, like all the moderns, like uh, Nobody has, and obviously the, all those artists saw the dinosaurs illustrations. They were very popular for quite a, they've been popular for a long time. Um, and I have like um, basically very few paintings. There's actually one uh, called Pompier Painter called Charles Aglaire that did a, a, a little painting with dinosaurs in the late uh, 19th century. And there's actually one of my favorite uh, Swiss painter called Hans Emmenegger that is a little bit obscure. Uh, but love him, but uh, he did, he did, a, he did a he two did paintings a of uh, dinosaurs, like kind of very, kind of, I think, but a really fantastic, and actually I, I was inspired by, uh, but again, if anybody knows of <laughs> painters, like, I mean, we think about like Josh Smith now, like, but uh, I will say that it's a different take also in the last maybe 30 years when a dinosaur, as a pop culture thing, is different than painting them as like a, a subject, so that's kind of, yeah. Right, right, um, and so, 
in this room there are other animals, so we want to bring now an, another artist uh, that uh, you've been particularly interested in, I guess, more recently, in the last yeah, few more years. Recently, yeah. uh, Rosa Bonheur, uh, this French uh, artist from the mostly second half of the 19th century, known for her uh, depictions of animals. There was a big show at Orsay uh, two years ago, I think, and, yeah. and, right. and you may know her from the very large painting at the Met uh, on the horse fair. Yeah. And um, so is it the show of Orsay that prompted you to get to turn your attention to Rosa Bonheur? Or? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, and uh, if, every time I mention that, uh, like, you know, it's uh, how important it is for, you know, curators and museums to do shows about artists that uh, are slightly, like, uh, you know, forgotten and not in the canon of, uh, you know, like history, like, you know, I mean, maybe Today, maybe I'm sure if we go how many Picasso show there's in the world, there's probably like I don't know 50. <laughs> uh, and and uh, you know, and, and Rosa Bonheur like didn't have any shows for a long time. I mean, probably forever more or less. So when they did the show, they did the catalog, and I basically saw the catalog. I, I was not in France doing that show, and I, I just got the so the, and I started to read it, and I was like really kind of um, kind of basically taken by the work like pretty directly. Um, and uh, and again, it's like really a, a, such an important thing for you know museums to you know find and, and showcase and research on those some artists because it's then you know artists like discover them, they make work, they're influenced by them, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, so yeah, the, so like basically, Rosa Bonheur is uh, is this extremely fascinating kind of character that uh, is very unique and 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 probably will hopefully have a lot more attention because her whole kind of Work, but also her life and her kind of, I think, uh, how how kind of uh, modern and current she is, the way she kind of basically addressed uh, wildlife and painting animals. So, like her main kind of, I will say, her main kind of uh, novelty by painting animal was to basically have empathy for for the animals that she was painting and have a, a very strong kind of um, feeling of. Uh, we have to see them as animals and not as an allegory or as like a symbol of, of basically human forces or sadness or gimmicking or like which is basically the full more or less the history of art with animals before that is it's a lot of that's like you know like it's either representing it's a metaphor or like a you know like a, an allegory of something uh, or is it basically symbols of power with the horses or royalty of you know dogs with the hunting dogs and she really basically paints animals for what what who they are like just a, a you know an individual kind of alive kind of a, a, a kind of person you know to say to say another word and uh, and she she paints a lot of basically also animals which kind of have kind of have this some, some sort of I will say like melancholy or sadness and you you see we're talking about the dog that is this kind of hunting uh, you know after the hunts. Um, dog that's you know again very often if you think about painting of, of dogs in, in it's in British tradition the hunting dog is like very proud and always like often you know think about like Rubens for example like the dogs are like attacking lions and they're like it's like it's very masculine it's like a lot of battles a lot of open mouth and she paints that dog that's basically look at the viewer with a lot of you know questions about you know what 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 are we doing here with you know, with animals and and again we it's 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 you know mid 19th century like thinking about our relationship with animal with empathy and seeing them with feelings and it, it seems like oh kind of obvious but you know, at that time it's, it's it doesn't exist at all it's like she's completely like you know we have a completely different kind of idea of uh, and she does that like she painted that eagle um, which is in a, there's a lot of actually a painting in America. But I think it's kind of ironic that is um, in the U.S. But basically, it's called the broken eagle, and I love the fact that she's, the, the, you know, again, think about painting of eagle. They always represent again power and like this kind of, you know, bird that is like attacking or like, and it's why it became the symbol of uh, of, of America in a way. Um, and uh, so, but she paints this like broken eagle that is like, uh, and actually, like the, her background is just the sky, so it looks like it's kind of falling and. It's kind of kind of dis disenchanted, and it, again, echoing the history of this bird in America is, is kind of interesting because this bird was, you know, seen seen as a pest for decades and decades, and almost like went to a brinch of extinctions because people hated the the, the, the bald eagle and eagles in general. Um, actually, kind of during her lifetime, like late her lifetime, probably, but and now, and it became like this like adored bird, but for a long time it was 
you know, killed by the, by the, by the thousands and thousands. Um, so yeah, I think like, again, like I really wanted to, and I think I'm gonna do more projects around her work, because I think there's a lot kind of to... Uh... Right, but what you want to talk about how you, so you say she represents those animals in this very realist and empathetic way. You are using them as kind of metaphor, symbol. I mean, you are using them as, as attributes in portraits. So you take a completely different approach. I'm using them as like, um, I think what I've been trying to do with those four portraits is like to have this kind of, on the background is this kind of portrait that is almost to me like almost like a ghost or like kind of a, kind of a presence of, I guess, human or something. And they kind of in the, in the front come almost hiding the, and basically the painting is this kind of dialogue between I guess the, you know, the viewer that's, basically the animal are, are between, the viewer and the portraits, and they're kind of in sandwich between the two in a way. Um, but yeah, they're, they're definitely, uh, they're different than the real painting, obviously. Like the, the aim is different because they, they become much more, in a way, symbolic maybe. Uh, and also because I'm not like directly, you know, like the, some viewer that will come here will not, maybe not know the painting. I mean, a lot of them probably. So they will take something probably quite different from the, uh, from, from the, uh, from the, from the painting. But you, there is also this aspect of Rosa Bonheur that she was, um, she was a woman who was dressing as a man. Uh, she had her special permission from the police to do so. <laughs> and um, she was queer and you know, she, I mean, she, there is this whole uh, aspect of her personality. And you associate her images with those genderless figures also. I mean, was there also something in her personality that was interesting to you, or was it just the paintings of animals? No, I mean, it's the, yeah, it's definitely the whole package, and she, again, she, you know, like, uh, there's some, some argue that she was the most successful and expensive painter at her time. Uh, she was, you know, when she painted the, the horse fair, when she finished the painting, she went on a tour all over England and Europe uh, because the painting was so popular and people were like going crazy about it. And she was like making tons of money. She bought a castle outside of Paris and she was living with her wife that uh, was also a painter. She was having lions and animals around her. And, and this it, is one of her dogs. Yeah, the, <laughs> one of her. <laughs> she, had, like, she had all those kind of very like yeah interesting kind of uh, and yeah as you as you mentioned basically the horse fair that is in, at the Met which is a, really a fantastic uh, painting. Um, uh, she wanted to paint that um, moment where basically like it was like the car sale but for horses, uh, and uh, she women were not allowed there. So you could ask a special actually his her wife was also uh, having this permit different kind of. Uh, painting, and, uh, but basically you had to dress as a man, disguise as a man, and you had to ask a permit, I think every six months. So she, she did that to be able to paint, um, the, the, to do all the studies. And so she has like, again, like a lot of, um, yeah, I guess contemporary kind of, you know, and, and she's, you know, as, as we know, it's, 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 be, it's becoming almost like a, a habit of discovering those kind of figure. I mean, I've, you know, I've been working with Rose Alba Carriera, and then we have this show at the Frick now. That's again like an artist that was gigantically successful. You know, like uh, as uh, you know, with like to her estate was like five times the amount of Canaletto, which is like the icon of that kind of moment in Venice. But she was much bigger in terms of uh, of sales and importance. Um, and and same with Rose, Rose Alba, and it's kind of. Uh, yeah, you know, it gets happening and again, but it's, you know, and I've, I've been working a little bit with um, different projects and it's, you know, fascinating to see like how, you know, for example, museums don't have any of her work, like almost, well, I mean, there's few museums obviously that have, but big museums have very little. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those examples of, uh, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's easy to get. It's not like, you know, it's not like, oh, you, we're going to get another Botticelli or, or Picasso, you know, like it's actually like affordable and they're great paintings. So museums should definitely, uh, yeah. Get on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, should we move to the next yes. one, maybe? Okay, so should we maybe start with the swamp? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Another huge mural. So you've done a lot of trees, uh, I guess, throughout your career. Uh, but they are usually, as we said earlier, more playful, colorful. Now we are in a swamp. And, uh, um, what uh, prompted you to tackle this subject? So yeah, maybe that subject became, uh, I mean, I guess it's a mix of, um, 
I think of the visual power of uh, you know some from some depiction of it and, and photograph it and 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 I think what they symbolize in history and also what they are now that we, we we know that basically wetlands in general and so swamps is part of this family of bogs and like different nomenclature for, for wetlands are basically one of the most precious ecosystem that exists in the world. And what is kind of interesting in our kind of history, I guess, is that um, it's one of the few kind of environment that's really a lot of life, love, but somehow humans really hate <laughs> wetlands because they can't do anything in it. It's like full of mosquitoes and tons of like different kind of species that we don't care about. You can't really farm it, you can't really like build in it. So basically the, the, the you know, the, the history of, uh, of, of human expansions in, in, in the territory and land is a lot of draining, you know, and there's like, you know, I mean, there's entire countries like Holland that were basically wet. Like it's a, I mean, and you can totally see like the paintings, you know, and there's, you know, it looks much more wet than, than now. Now it's like field, 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 field. Uh, but you know all this kind of area, and uh, and of course the U.S. Uh, as we know the, the famous line of drain the swamp because Washington was obviously built into a big wetland. Versailles was also built uh, into a completely wetland, which at the time like people said, why you want to build your big things in the middle of a swamp? Like can you just choose a place when it's easier? But uh, and you know th there's a also amazing kind of uh, and sad, but you know like uh, history with the Everglades in Florida that's. For you know, centuries, people have been like, "Oh my God, if we can drain that part of the <laughs> of Florida, there will be an an, an an immense kind of uh, you know you know capital for farming and like developing houses and everything." And you know, so far, like nobody found out, and we, they tried <laughs> you know millions of ways, and it's impossible. Basically, it's too big, and the 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 complexity of the environment is basically as as for once too too big for humans to tackle on. <laughs> but there is a movement now against that anyway to not drain the swamps <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because yeah. they are such important ecosystems for human life and for many forms of life. So is there also a comment on the whole uh, as we were talking about the wildfire, about uh, a position that you are taking, in fact, in the... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it's a position because I think it's pretty straightforward. It's like wildfire, like, I don't think there's like, a, in a way, a position to have. It's like, well, there's, nobody is like, oh yeah, great wildfire, let's just do more. It's like, everybody's <laughs> playing like from, you know, from every angle, probably will say like, well, this is not fantastic. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think draining wetland, that's maybe different. I think some, you know, still often when you want to build an airport or like expand, there's like a lot of resistance. But yeah, very, very clearly, there's a lot of places. I think in Scotland, there's a lot of uh, areas they're trying to basically um, kind of basically put water again in it. it they absorb basically the, the, the carbon more than forests. It's like really incredible, the capacity of like absorbing carbons. So like yeah, there's like a definitely a re renaissance of, uh, of 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 the swamp. So yeah, I mean that's kind of uh, and, and again like I think what I was finding interesting was the, calling the show swamp because I think the word swamp is still negative in in our kind of and especially in the last kind of years with this whole like political aspect of the swamp um, and and I think like in. Also in American history, there's like this old kind of idea of the South with the swamp and you know the slave slavery slave history. That's you know every kind of escape of slave goes to a swamp in the in the in, in the literature and the like. Uh, and I find it like it's also kind of an iconic kind of uh, landscape in, in in American history. So just by depicting depicting them and naming the show swamp, I think then people can you know go go from there. I mean now I'm talking about all my, but I think. The point is also to say, like, when you come into the show, you don't, you know, you come with your own, I guess, uh, knowledge or, you know, like, um, association with those very strong topic. As we said, like, you know, probably a lot of people don't know what Zabana and all those stories, so they, they see the painting in a different yes. way, or swamps also, they see it in right. a different way. I mean, it's true that the swamp in the imagination and in literature is often associated with death and disease and uh, yeah. and on that topic the yellow is that a reference to that yellow that was made mostly with arsenic no <laughs> <laughs> no that's like that's i will say purely like uh, my kind of uh, you know exploration of, of uh, basically like rendering water and reflection uh, and my kind of fascination i guess with uh, klimt and his like I love Klimt and his water reflection landscapes. Um, 
like I'm really like drawn to them, and I am a big uh, Monet uh, Nafea fan. I'm like uh, I can't, you know, I, I, I love them very much. So <laughs> that's a little bit of a. So you, can, you can see like there's a little bit more of a, I guess, impressionist, this you know, type of like touch into the to, to build this transparency and those like colors. So there's a bit of pink, the yellow, and like it's the this 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 and water and and. I mean, as uh, Monet knew, he was obviously doing those little like uh, swampy type thing because of that too. Yeah, I guess the swamp. But when it's with the nymphias, it's not so swampy. Let's not say. so swampy. It's a clean swamp. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, I guess, contrasted the swamp with the clear water of the waterfall and with the pristine mountain. I mean, was it? Uh... Yeah, I mean, in this room, like. I mean, in, like, actually, like when I like when we installed it, like I did feel like there was too many different strong symbols in one room. Uh, but you know, the room is is very large, and it, we didn't want to build a wall in the middle. But it's like typically in my in my head, I will maybe prefer to have yeah, not maybe so many direct because like we have those and those and the mountain and the fire. It's a little bit like, and I usually like feel it's better to uh, to have them. But of course, everything dialogue with each other. But like. I will say, like the the waterfall as a um, you know as a, as a symbol, especially I think in, in in kind of more like you know kind of uh, Asian kind of tradition, the, the 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 idea of basically longevity and time passing uh, is very represented by the the waterfall. But the whole idea of river floating is is obviously like a, a very old symbols of the time passing, and because like these these themes of I guess like time and history and the, 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 overall, the overall kind of um, idea of extinctions. So like this whole idea of time passing and like flowing is kind of, you know, representing in those kind of, uh, in, in uh, I love the, uh, the, in French called cascade, but I love the name uh, also of the, the actual word waterfall in, uh, in English because it's just so, in a way, kind of silly, but it's also quite poetic, this waterfalls. Like, <laughs> it's kind of a little, I kind of like that. <laughs> and the mountains? This is your Swiss background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, so yeah, like the mountains are, they're fairly new and uh, it's true that as you mentioned, uh, my Swiss background and actually the background of this uh, gallery. <laughs> uh, and uh, so yeah, I, I grew up in Switzerland. I think it's like two third of Switzerland is, or one third of Switzerland is, is mountain. It's a very small country and basically mountains are everywhere. Like it's really like you, do it's like I guess maybe living in Montana here or something, but you you know you open the window more or less everywhere in Switzerland and you have mountain and you know some of, some of them are pretty high up so they're pretty spectacular and uh, as we know in the you know 19th century in the romantic kind of area um, like this kind of majestic kind of Swiss mountains and landscape is 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 kind of a big kind of part of uh, I guess where I'm from and the culture and it's the I guess the figure of someone like Audelaire, the, 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 which you had the show of drawing that just closed up, uh, so you're very familiar with it, is, is a, you know, it's basically a, really an iconic presence in, in Swiss kind of visual culture. So yeah, I did somehow felt like, you know, one day I will have to do mountains and it's, I guess it's now <laughs> exploring them. Uh, the very big difference, let's say with Audelaire is um, uh, my mountains are not, Audelaire actually titles is always basically the Jungfrau, you know, the, the Mont Blanc, you know, it's basically the, it's the depicting, name of the mountains. Yeah, it's yeah. depicting the mountains. That would be actually a little bit more romantic where, you know, if you think about Frederick, it doesn't really look like an actual. So these are not actual? You didn't no. actually look at the mountain to make No, them all my landscapes is completely sort of iconic made up. Kind of. Yeah, it's like, I think it's a mix between uh, pure imagination, but also this whole idea of this kind of almost like digital, <laughs> kind of fake world that we live in where, you know, like, I mean, it's going to be more and more now, obviously, with the AI that we, we can make landscapes so, so easily and quickly uh, and portraits and anything. But they do, I think, have a little bit of a sense of, I think if you actually look at them pretty, pretty easily, you can see they're not real. They're, the way that the, 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 the rendering is, it's actually very flat. So you can see this almost like, doom, doom, doom. it's like gimmicking like a, um, kind of a, a perspective, but actually, like if you were depicting mountains from a photo, it will look very different, very, very quickly, because like it's more like they're pretending to be a volume, and fun, but they're like kind of almost like a, yeah, like a di almost like a digital rendering of what will be a, like a beautiful, like kind of mountain kind of scape, kind of landscape, and I've, I've been kind of yeah trying to kind of 
make those kind of landscapes in, in that kind of right. regard. So uh, I guess, so these, all the paintings here are pastel, the large paintings, pastel on canvas. Yeah. And uh, so why on doing pastel on canvas rather than on paper or why not use oil on canvas? I mean, <laughs> what, what uh, draws you? I, we talked about the use of the pastel in the murals, but what about in the paintings? So, yeah, I mean, pa pa pastel on paper, basically, you reduce often by the size of it. I mean, of course, you can, like, uh, you know, like, glue a big piece of paper on canvas. The main thing I will say with paper is, like, you can't really find paper with a really rough surface, uh, rough, as rough as I want. So my surface is quite rough. If you think about sandpaper, there will be, like, you know, whatever the grade is that is rough. Um, and so basically it takes more pigments. Like if you think about so like soft, if you have a normal pastel paper, not even a card or whatever you can call it, the, the amount of pastel deposit on it is actually very thin. And actually if you go to see the Frick, you see the Rose Alba, it's actually on this blue paper, the amount of pastel is much less than on my, the paper that I use actually. It's like, so with those guys, even in the world, you can build up slightly more pigments and that, so they look a little bit more painterly actually than drawing. Uh, so that's kind of something that, that, that I like and I mean pastel has been my yeah my, my medium now for I don't know 10 years and I really kind of love working with it I think it's, it fits me very well but as, as you see in the show there's like those little um, oil painting on copper that I'm also starting to enjoy because I can sit down it's kind of I don't have to like have a lot of dust. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of more nice. Quiet. More quiet. Uh, and so talking about it, maybe we should end with these two more mysterious uh, pieces, a sort of triptych uh, that evoke obviously Renaissance triptychs and uh, also the way they are painted on both sides and I suppose they can close just yeah, like they can uh, close. Not like, Yeah, they can close, yeah. And, uh, and on what we call FOMA, well, fake marble yeah, that's and fake, fake that's wood. <laughs> so how did, why are you making those pieces? What was the idea? You know? I think I started to do those pieces for a very specific, uh, I mean, as you can, you heard me like a few times, it was a specific show in Milan at the Paul di Pizzoli, which is kind of a little bit like the Frick. It's like a, one of those very early, one of really the first kind of private museum uh, in, the, in the late kind of 19th century where there was all those period rooms uh, for Mr. Mr. Pelosi and uh, basically like in the, and we had like, I was invited to do a little project in that environment and, and it's, it's, you can imagine it's full of little beautiful little, you know, paintings and, and artifacts and, you know, sculptures and this, so that you can't really do hang like big paintings or whatever. So, and they had this, uh, basically this, uh, called Tobin, Tobinacle, which was basically more or less exactly the same size, and it was basically a portable altar uh, that was kind of made for, yeah, I mean, it was literally a portable <laughs> altar for like, you know, like, like kind of uh, religious purpose. You can just bring it with you, and I was like very drawn to the, to the object as like a, little, like a little mini museum, a portable artwork. Like not that, but like you know, recalling a little bit of the uh, Duchamp like suitcase, which uh, you know I think every artist loves so much. This idea of having all the all, all, all the artwork in a little suitcase that you can bring <laughs> with you, and so like as, as basically I did like a series of five of those for this show that we did in Plinth in this in this little room, and so those are basically like new ones of those, uh, uh, and as a as a, I guess as a con very pretty big consumer of image you know, especially in, in Western kind of history uh, and, and obviously like the, the amount of religious kind of uh, depiction and object that has been made uh, influence every more or less every, every Western artist. And uh, so like the, the, I always love the idea that those objects, especially the big retables that uh, are in churches, more, most of them now are in museums, but they were obviously made for church and the, ba the all the outside that you can see in all of them in museums sometimes, they display them in the way that you can see the back. But uh, you know, all the outside was black and white uh, for different reasons. But one of the main reasons is obviously black and white was less sensitive to the light, uh, and so also, but also because you will have this like every, all year long, you will only see the retable more or less closed, and they will open it for special occasion, for special celebrations. And I really love this idea of this very theatrical, performative painting object that existed in the you know like. You know, think about the uh, you know the annual mystic, the, the you know the Van Eyck one, you know, which is like has like you know 16 kind of different 
you know, it was closed all year, and then sometimes you will open that thing for like, I will probably be a, really a spectacular kind of, uh, and uh, you know, of course it will protect the, the work inside because obviously there was all this, you know, smoke and candle lights and all that stuff. So there's, you know, I, I've been enjoying, so on this one, actually this one is only wood, but this one has the mountain black and white. Um, and it's like, I use the faux marble because also in, uh, in whole this big chapter of art history, like the, uh, the art is so kind of in, in, embedded with architecture that's, you know, like the four marble is used so much in fresco and, but also in paintings in the Renaissance. Uh, and I, I, would, I, I love playing with those little, little references. Yeah, and those are not portraits, uh, the two figures that are, I mean, they are imaginary figures. Yeah, all my portraits, they're the same as the mountain, they don't, yeah, they don't, they don't exist. Nothing is real. <laughs> Nothing is real, yeah. <laughs> Does this one close? No. No. So that just takes the, the, yeah, the shape of the, the retard, but it's, yeah, it's just like a triptych that, you, that nothing is on the back. <laughs> uh, should we take some, do you have any pressing questions? Uh, yes? I have a question about uh, how long will it take, how long does it take you to do a mural like this? Because I know you have an upcoming show in Baden Baden, where you're doing like the whole museum. Yeah. You work with, uh, yeah, it's actually it's actually quite quick. So my like so what well, there's there's few there's, there's a, we need to spray the surface, which I don't do. So someone comes and spray like uh, and that takes like maybe like six hours uh, for well I mean let's say half a day or a day whatever. And uh, and then basically I do the sketch, which I guess I'll if we project I don't need to do that part either. I can work on another mural. Uh, and then the, the, the way it works is that either, like on the fire one, I did everything by myself because it's the size and it's, there's not a lot of like, you know, like um, blank, I mean like full color kind of feeling. So that I did by myself. So this one is done in like three days, the fire one just by myself. And this one is done, uh, but it's, it's like kind of working fairly fast. Like it's, you should be done more in five, so you can have a little bit more break. <laughs> uh, and this one, this one, you can actually like for example, the, all the trees is first painted with this kind of dark green, so that can be done by someone else. And then I do, and uh, the, all the background is one color, and then I come to do the fading. So like it depends, yeah, it depends how like the 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 the, the, the fall kind of, but I can have help for sure, like in some parts of the. Uh, I guess I will say you can have 20%, 30% of the mural that can be helped and uh, maybe 70, 60% is, has to be done by me. You start with a small sketch done in pastel as yeah. well? Yeah, sometimes either like in Baden Baden, there's some painting that I, you know, I will literally take this one, not, not this one actually, but a very similar one that I did and I will just like project and just do more or less the same but on a much, much bigger scale. But it's through in Baden Baden that I'm going tonight we have a lot of mural to do in a very short amount of time, so, well, but I never really did it, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What happens afterwards? That's, uh, that, it goes, uh, goes into the dust to dust, goes into the wind. <laughs> <laughs> you bring a vacuum cleaner? <laughs> yeah, you do, actually, like, it's interesting, like, different places uh, do, do it differently, like, some people use water to clean it at the Flag Art Foundation, they use, but I think that can create a much bigger mess. I think the best way is to actually, yeah, hoover it, because it's dust. So you can, if you touch it now, like if you brush it, it's gonna go away. Um, if you, if you blow it, it's gonna go away. I mean, you have to blow pretty strong, but uh, and then you just sand it a little bit and you paint it over. But what does it feel like for you to have it disappear and then start somewhere else again? I really, you know, I really like that part. Yeah, I really like doing more <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, I wish I was doing more of the. <laughs> You know, because uh, this, this it's, it doesn't happen with a lot of things that we produce. Uh, actually, most things that human we do every day, they, we don't think about, oh, they're gonna stay here forever. Like, you know, when you cook something, you just eat it and you enjoy it and, you know, we don't think about it. And it's the, the or if you think about music for, and, until it was recorded, so like every music performance, and they, they were done and there was, that was it, you know, there was never a recording of it. There was, and it's, that's a lot of centuries of music that's, you know, all those people thought, well, nobody will, you know, hear the same musician, the same voice again. Uh, and I think like in arts, there's, there's, and it became really kind of uh, intense, this obsession of like preserving everything and this idea that, uh, 
you know, like they will be preserved forever, you know, like the, 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 the bit of the idea of the pyramid, right? It's like, you know, when they were made, like they will stay forever. And maybe it's interesting actually in our maybe new, new vision of the future that is maybe less kind of uh, fixed into, oh yeah, like we're definitely going to be here forever. I mean, we're going to be here for a while probably, but definitely not forever. <laughs> Have collectors asked you to do a mural in their apartment that they would keep? Yeah, I did, I did that You've a few done. times, yeah, yeah. but I, I never did in pastel, that will be, ah, so yeah. I did in acrylic or in oil, um, yeah, I did, I, did, I did a few times, yeah. But not in pastel, yeah. yeah. Not in pastel. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? You already explained this, I think, but I want to ask again, I mean, you talked about Sanho painting, so why do you have the two-dimensional uh, affectless portrait with the, um, I mean, yeah, again, I think like what I like, what I, when, I, when you describe it, what I like to think about is like exactly like this person is obviously look like a human in a way, like, uh, but it's true, like my portraits have this like, they, they look like almost the mask or like the, and I sometimes describe them as like a, like a CGI or, or the kind of the Greek vision of, uh, you know, when basically like bef the Roman kind of invented a little bit of the, in sculptures and you know like the portrait that will look like someone but in the Greek basically faces are just perfect faces and they don't look like but they also have this feeling of being like those people obviously don't exist they don't have any wrinkle they're like you know and so like and I think in our age we, we see a lot of those faces you know in the in the in the magazines or internet more and more with the, everything is filtered to that kind of digital and, and now with the AI we're gonna see so much more of those faces that uh, you know that we'll not really know, but and I think that's, I think I think about those this look it's from those people. If it's a bit robotic in a way, or like a spirit, uh, and of course the animals is kind of the opposite. And I think we are in, as I said, like he's the he's in the middle, like, and they all they're both looking at us, but we kind of the animal is in its, its sandwich between us. That's you know, and then whoever is looking at it can make his own kind of. Uh, you know, journey about those, those di what you perceive into this, um, into this different kind of uh, perception of what is, you know, what is life, what is like real, and what is <laughs> all those different kind of topic. Have you tried to, or has someone tried to do this kind of work through AI by inserting all of your paintings and trying to create a Nicola Parti uh, portrait with animals, <laughs> with Rosa <laughs> Bonheur yeah, animal. I, I didn't see it yet, but I, I tried myself, you know, like, you know, there's this app that you can upload a bunch of photos of yourself and it creates a bunch of like avatar and it's, uh, I mean, as we you know, that's been all, it's been all over, like we, everybody talks a lot. I mean, in the writing, it's like really, I mean, it's always the strike. It's, <laughs> but in, uh, I think in art, it's slightly different because in art, the, uh, the, I think people really want the, the man-made. And you know, art is using tools that are so basic uh, and so kind of directly manual. You know, it's, it's, no, it's, it's a reason why ceramic and like craft in general is still very present. I mean, if you see the art world right now, like it's, it's very little, little digital contents. And it's, it's not because like, you know, the NFT community is like, oh, we, we don't like digital, like the art world. It's, it's because like the art world feels basically in a way like the, the timeless of the gesture using you know I mean when you use charcoal you literally use the first you know mark making tools ever made by human it's basically a piece of you know like bur burned woods but also like if you use a pencil or a paint that's what you give to like you know an 11 months years old kid and they, they know how to use it so the tool that artists like to use I think they are basically the most basic tool that we have, you know, they, they're more simple than a fork and a knife, you know, a, a, a pen is like super, super simple. So, and I, and I think like I will, I'm not really worried about making art because I think if we did, you know, it's not we are in the first kind of technical, technological evolution. Look at the, if you go to every art fair or every museum or every show, like most, most people use the most basic tools and, you know, we did photography when printmaking, you know, like computer has been here for a long time now and still people just want to paint <laughs> this like just, very childish kind of uh, activity. Any last question? Yes? Where have you studied art history? 
I didn't study, I mean I studied arts actually, just not, not <laughs> practical art I guess. Uh, I studied in Lausanne a little bit, but it was actually graphic design. It was uh, and actually cinema first, then a little bit of graphic design, then I went to Glasgow to study uh, MFA, but I, I didn't study uh, art history. So you haven't, but you obviously know a lot about it. Well, but I'm really not, uh, and sometimes people say, oh you, you like very knowledgeable, actually I'm not really, I'm, I just love art and I'm very passionate about it, so I always I consume it like more as a, but I'm very not academic about it. I'm actually not like a huge, kind of, you know, I'm not taking notes and like making, writing things. I'm, <laughs> I'm not writing essays, I'm a terrible, terrible writer. Uh, and every time I, I get asked to write something, I'm like, ah, oh, please, please, it's terrible. So I, I just more, I love, I love art and I love like discovering things, you know, again, when I discovered the, uh, was Alba a few years ago, and, and, and to this, um, every time I, I'm, I'm like just completely in love and in passionate about it. That's the. Yes, yes for the Rosalba. 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 Yeah, the two, the two are pink. Rose. The two Rosa. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. The, Xavier the Freak mentioned it's funny. You did the two show with the two Rosa. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.